Okay, uh, welcome everybody for a second uh, day. Um, uh, we're, we have a very uh, exciting and uh, uh, busy uh, schedule, and uh, uh, we'll just uh, start, and the talent will be uh, chaired today. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, uh, first speaker today is Bobby yep. Scheuer, and we'll uh, speak about the uh, Okay, thank you, Talon David. Good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for getting up so early just to hear me, at least I hope. Uh, my name is Gobi Shor, I'm from the School of Electrical Engineering, and what I'm going to show you today is our work on nano antenna and the, uh, for applications in light generation and uh, detection. Now, this is just a part or a fraction of a huge project which is led by three groups, the group of uh, Amir Bog, Yael Khanin, and mine, and these are our students that actually do the actual job. So, uh, before I start, thanks for the uh, funding agency, MAFAT, the Advanced Communication Center, and the Ministry of Science and Technology. I'm doing it right now because generally I tend to forget these things. So, uh, given the, uh, uh, the mixed uh, type of audience here, I decided to uh, separate my talk into two sections. The first section is rel uh, relatively broad, giving you a bit about the essence of what nanophotonics is all about, um, a bit about the physics and its history, then a more technical part about uh, nano antennas, how we make and characterize them, and some of the applications. I will talk about uh, power harvesting and detection, the generation, and I have some, if I have some time left, about particle trapping, after which I'll summarize. So what is nanophotonics? If we summarize everything there is to do with nanophotonics, we could say that it's the generation, detection, and manipulation of light using nanometer scale structures and features. Now, but if we think about it, it seems that this is a contradiction in terms. And why is that? Wave, the wavelength of light is relatively long, okay? Uh, in telecommunication, we're talking about a wavelength of a one and a half micron, and the visible is between 400 and 800 nanometers. So these are a lot of nanos. In a single word, where's the nano here? Okay, it seems that there's nothing to do, there's nothing to do in nano and optics. But this is not exactly the case. And the, Key physics here is working with metals. And metals have an interesting feature. It allows for the evolution of an interesting uh, phenomenon, which is known as surface plasmon polaritons, or as the people try to shorten it, surface plasmons or plasmons. So this is an interesting or a unique mode of interaction between particles and, uh, and light. And that is the following. Let's think of a, of a metallic nanoparticle in the following way. It has a positively charged ions, which are relatively uh, fixed. They don't go anywhere. They're not free to go. And there's the electron uh, gas, okay, which can actually move somewhere because they are much lighter. When I illuminate, illuminating, illuminating that thing with uh, light, light has an electromagnetic wave. The electric field exerts a force on these electrons, and they can move them around. And if I hit this particle in the right frequency, this whole cloud of electron will start to oscillate in a single frequency. This is a called a plasmonic resonance or a plasma resonance. And if we think about it, it's very similar to uh, what you see when you swing your kids or nephews in, uh, in the playground. If you try to drive your swing too fast or too slow, it would barely move. But if you drive it, if you hit it just right, your time or pushes with the, uh, let's say, natural frequency of your uh, swing, you can really build up a nice amplitude, okay? Same thing works here. If we uh, illuminate this particle in the resonance frequency, this little thing can actually absorb and suck in electromagnetic power from a cross-section, which is uh, orders of magnitude larger than the actual size of the particle, okay? In that sense, this little particle acts very similar to an antenna, and I will go to that later. Okay, so the important thing to know about these uh, resonances in uh, nanoparticles is that they are uh, affected not only by the type of material, but also by the size and shape of our structure, okay? Spheres and, and uh, rice-like structure would have completely different resonances. At resonances, these particles absorb the energy. They act like antenna, very like antennas, very similar to the antennas that you have on your uh, so, used to have, probably I guess, on your cell phone, in your car, and so on. They can suck in the energy. Now, in many cases, nanoparticles have nothing to do with this energy, so they, they re radiate or scatter it, and then uh, this is the main effect that we are working with. 
just as an example, uh, what we see here is a solution, okay, with our bunch of solutions with nanoparticles. These are not actually metals, but semiconductor, but this is not the issue. The only difference between these different uh, tubes is the size of the nanoparticles. It is, it is the same material, but different size. And because of the size, each particle has a different color, meaning a different resonance. And this is the key point that we need to understand here. So we, we like to think about nanophotonics about as a uh, very new uh, type of uh, research, but it has very old roots. Uh, back in the medieval, people have been using gold met or metal nanoparticles to stain glass and make these beautiful um, um, windows in cathedrals and churches. Uh, the most Probably the most famous example is this cup from the uh, 4th century uh, AD. Uh, it's made of glass with small part, with a small amount of um, gold particles. When illuminated from the outside, it appears green. But when it is illuminated from the inside, it appears red. It has to do with the resonance frequency of these particles inside uh, uh, this cup. Nevertheless, we can actually trace the first application of nanophotonics back to the age of the Bible. Specifically, the episode of the golden calf, uh, calf uh, Exodus chapter 32. And if you recall, Moses goes down from Mount Sinai and see all uh, the children of Israel dance around the golden calf. He gets really mad. So he goes down, takes the calf, burns it, ground it into powder, mix it with water, and make all the people drink it. So what do we have here? We have a solution of water with gold nanoparticle, which probably gave it this uh, red or blood-like uh, color that uh, uh, made everybody sick over there. OK. So um, today we have better technologies to uh, make stained glasses. And I don't think that golden cuffs are being used anymore. So what do we do with nanophotonics? There are many uh, in plasmonics. There are many applications. I think the most uh, interesting one is the ability to make artificial materials or metamaterials. Uh, these materials have properties which basically do not exist in natural materials. For example, uh, we all know that if you put a straw or a pencil in a glass of water, it seems that this straw breaks. This is due to the uh, phenomenon of, diff of uh, refraction and has to do with the, the fact with that the water here has an index of refraction which is positive and equals, ar equals around 1.3. Now, using metamaterials, which basically means that we take arrays or a large number of nano uh, uh, structures smaller than wavelength, we can actually make this uh, material which has a negative refractive index. And if we do that, then the image of what we see when we put this pencil inside the water will be completely different. So this is, looks very exciting, but it has also interesting application. Probably the most well, important one or exciting one is the ability to to do cloaking, to hide, to make uh, things invisible. And the way we do that is to take advantage of a phenomenon which, we, a phenomenon which we are actually familiar with. It's called Fata Morgana. What happens here is that uh, the layers of the air close to the surface are warmer than those who are far away. As a result, the refractive index of the air is a little bit different. And a ray coming from the tree here would bend and goes to the eye of the observer. In the same way, light coming out from here would never reach the eye of the observer, making this, area, this uh, uh, regime here basically invisible. So the impact or the ability to use this effect in natural materials is relatively limited. But if we have the ability to make this, we can really make light bend around some area and make this area totally invisible. And maybe one of, the day, one of these days, we will be able to realize an in, 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 in invisibility clock like Harry Potter has. So plasmonics could do magic, but it could also do some more down-to-earth things and, and has very uh, familiar applications. Uh, all of you are familiar with them. Some of you probably have been using it, maybe more than once. Here it is, the pregnancy test. This little red line over here is a plasmonic effect generated by enhanced scattering due to binding of nanoparticles here, which are caused by the uh, existence of a protein which is indicative to pregnancy. So surprise, surprise, plasmonic is not only some uh, science fiction uh, area. It also has some practical implications. OK, so basically, if I manage to convey the message correctly, the idea is that we are working with small particles of metals and 
we are working around the resonance frequency. And at the resonance frequency, they work, they act like antennas. So let's talk about antennas and go a little bit more into the technical part of our uh, in, of the talk. Specifically, we all know what an antenna is, right? But what happens when we downscale it into optical wavelength? So let's start with the basics. If we open up a textbook in uh, antenna theory, we see that antenna is defined as a device that provides the means for uh, transmitting and receiving electromagnetic waves. So surprise, surprise, light is also an electromagnetic wave. So maybe we can use antennas for visible and infrared light. Now, the most common or well most uh, known antenna is the dipole antenna, which we see here, consists of a, uh, a metal wire. Okay, which is broken and it's connected into some kind of a transmission line here, which is called the feed. And when we illuminate this nano antenna, or it receives some electromagnetic wave, then the electromagnetic wave induces currents in this, uh, uh, this wire. And these currents are directed into the uh, line feed over here and connected to our uh, receiver where we can, I don't know, hear the radio or do something else with it. As note that this is a very similar effect to what we had in the scattering of light from our nanoparticles. Now, the whole thing can work in a reverse direction, meaning we can launch uh, electromagnetic uh, power or current into the feed, uh, induce currents in the, in the antenna, and as a result, electromagnetic wave would be radiated from that structure in a way. This is called the transmission mode of the antenna. Now, the antenna has resonance frequencies, like the nanoparticles, specifically for in RF, radio frequency, sorry, and, low, and um, perfectly metallic uh, and, uh, antennas. Uh, the wavelength in which this whole structure resonates has to be a, a multiple integer of, a, of the length of the wire. Now, the radiation from this uh, little uh, thing over here is not uniform, okay? It's not like, it does not generate a, a spherical wave that goes from uh, the center and outwards. It has a shape. This is called the radiation pattern. And for this uh, dipole antenna, it looks like a toroid. It emits a lot of, most of the power in a direction which is perpendicular to the length of the antenna. And it emits absolutely nothing in a direction which is parallel to uh, the direction of the antenna. Okay. Now, what happened in optical frequency? In optical frequency, we have a little bit of a complication because in optical wavelength, metals can no longer be considered as perfect electric metal. And the whole mode of operation of this antenna changes a bit. And what we have is the evolution of a new thing. Okay, it's a hybrid electrical and electromagnetic uh, mode, uh, which is called the surface plasmon, consisting of electromagnetic waves or lights in the dielectric and charge density in the metals. This is a surface wave. Okay? It exists primarily on the surface between the uh, dielectric, say air, and the metal, our nano antenna. And the field here decays exponentially in the uh, dielectric material and in the metal, so it doesn't look like it because the decay here is extremely, extremely fast. But if we zoom in on this area, you can see that it decays very, very fast. The penetration depth here is in the order of, let's say, 10 nanometers, give or take. So if we, uh, try, to, when we try to model this thing, and we take the uh, air or the dielectric uh, material here having a dielectric coefficient epsilon 1, and if we use the Drude model to uh, describe the dielectric properties of the metal, we can find a solution for this surface wave, and these are the only equations that you're going to see in this presentation. It has a uh, shape which, is, uh, which depends on the transverse direction. It has some kind of propagation coefficient. We can actually solve it and get a number for that, or a graph in my case. And what we see here is the dispersion relation. It's the relation between the frequency of the light and 2 pi over the wavelength in the, uh, let's say, material. For example, in air, this ratio is linear. It has to do with the speed of light. In the metal, okay, in the branch of the surface plasma polyton, we see an interesting phenomenon. Phenomena. When we get to a certain frequency, the band here becomes very, very flat. The wavelength, which is 2 pi over what the number that you see here, becomes extremely small, much smaller than the wavelength in the air. And once the wavelength becomes small, it means that we can actually manipulate light 
using a very small structure because it's the wavelength that determines what happened, uh, how, it in, how the light interacts with the, uh, with the structure. So working here, we have the ability to go beyond the wavelength of uh, or the conventional wavelength of material and make everything much, much smaller. And this is, by the way, the reason why small, part, uh, small particles, much smaller than the wavelength, can actually interact with light and do something interesting. All right, so now that we know what an antenna is, let's uh, see what kind of antennas we do and how we characterize them. Now, uh, in the RF regime, radio frequency regime, the antennas are in the order of 10, 20, 30 centimeters, like you see on cars. In optics, they are substantially smaller. They are less than a micron. So in order to do that, we fabricate uh, nano antennas on uh, transparent uh, films, quartz, uh, silica, using liftoff and e-beam lithography. And here are some examples for uh, the antennas that we make. This is a very simple dipole antenna. Let's zoom in on that, OK? Very similar to the wire that you have on your uh, car, for example. The only difference is the length, OK? This is about 400 nanometer, and this is about 90 nanometer. We can make many kinds of antenna. One of the uh, antennas that we make is a bow tie antenna. Let's zoom in on that. It looks like a bow tie. Uh, the advantage of such antenna is that it is it uh, has a much broader, a broader bandwidth than a conventional dipole. We also uh, do split dipole antennas, which we can see here. This is very similar to the type of uh, classical antenna which I showed in the previous uh, part of the talk. Again, dimensions are pretty much the same, 400 nanometer, 900 nanometer, and this is about 20 nanometer of gap over here. Interesting thing about the structure, it allows for uh, very high intensities of light here in the gap between these two parts of metals, and this is important because we are going to use it later. How do we characterize them? Because of the nature of uh, the physics here and uh, our lack of ability to make uh, current and voltage sources which oscillate at optical frequency, we cannot just simply connect our antenna into some kind of a power source and transmit um, energy. We need to do something more sophisticated. And the way we do that is that we excite them optically. We illuminate our antennas with uh, a laser beam. And if we hit it correctly, then it sucks in all the power. But these antennas are not connecting, connected anywhere. So they have absolutely nothing to do with their uh, power except to re-radiate or scatter it. So we illuminate and excite our antennas, and then we measure the emission from our antenna. And this way, we can characterize their uh, frequency, their polarization properties, and a lot of interesting uh, uh, characteristics that we will show in the next slide. So one of the important things to understand about antennas is that they are polarization sensitive. If we take an antenna and we illuminate it in a polarization which is parallel to its longer axis, it would probably react strongly. If we try to illuminate it in the uh, orthogonal polarization, it would not okay, scatter the light very efficiently. So first sanity check is to verify that our antenna actually has this property. If they don't, we're in the problem. So when we illuminate the antennas in the correct uh, polarization, we get this, this, this signal. This is the, uh, the intensity that we measure as a function of the wavelength. We see nice, strong signal. Rotating the polarization by 90 degrees, and get this, basically nothing. So uh, just to make sure that we, are calculate, uh, that we are observing the correct thing, we have calculated how this curve over here should look like, and this is what it looks like. The resonance is in the correct position. The width is pretty much the same. Bottom line, our structure, our polarization sensitive, they act like antennas. Next, let's see what kind of spectral properties they have. So this is a complicated graph, so let's see if I can uh, explain that. What we see here is the spectral response, meaning the intensity which is scattered from, scattered from our nano antennas as a function of the wavelength for three different lengths. And what the important things to see here are the following. Depending on the length of the antenna, we get different spectral properties. We get a shift in the resonance. And know that these are very small differences, OK? The longer antenna is about 500 nanometer long, and the shorter antenna is a bit less than 400 nanometer long. The resonance shifts by more than 200 nanometers, OK? So we have the ability to, con to precisely control the resonance frequencies of our nano antenna. By the way, we can uh, actually monitor not only the overall intensity which is emitted from the antenna, we can actually image the beam, the beam which is emitted from the nano antenna. This is what we see here. 
it's a, an array, it's a finite array of a rectangular uh, shape. So we expect the beam shape to have a double sync profile, which is exactly what we see here. Now, there are a lot of information we can uh, extract from these kind of plot. By the way, I didn't mention it, but this is the experiment. And this is a model that we have constructed based on finite element uh, frequency domain simulations. One thing that you can extract is the radiation efficiency or efficiency or scattering efficiency, which means how much light is being re-emitted from the antenna. And the important thing to note is that actually most of the light is being re-emitted. We don't lose much power here, only 5%, which for me was kind of a surprise. that I was expecting a much lower number here. We have very good agreement between the experiments and the model. And uh, we can, again, control the frequency and the bandwidth very nicely. So let's talk about applications, now that we understand about how to make, how to make antennas in optical frequencies. Uh, in order to do that, I would like to give a two motivation slides of why we're actually looking for applications in nan using nano antennas. Conventional optics has some, uh, let's say, inherent drawbacks. First, all, the, um, all what it can do is basically work with the propagating waves. There are a lot of uh, uh, solutions which are lost. Okay? It's called the near field. And as a result, our ability to image and to focus light are limited by diffraction, and we can manipulate and focus and do things in order of wavelengths. Okay? Given the fact that the index of refraction of materials in nature is between 1 to 4, that doesn't give us a lot of playground here. Finally, making these, or fabricating a structure in small dimension with these materials is kind of complex, so we are kind of limited with what conventional optics can give us. On the other hand, if we work with nano antennas or, uh, or metals, we are in a completely different regime. They work very similar to the RF uh, uh, counterparts, and their properties are not a, um, controlled primarily by the uh, composite or by the material, but by the geometry. So playing with the geometry, we can modify, we can tune, we can engineer the response that we like. Unlike conventional optics, let's say lenses, mirror, and so on, nano antennas can focus light into extremely sub-wavelength small spots. So we can manipulate light in sub-sub-wavelength uh, uh, volumes. And give this gives us a lot of potential for interesting and novel applications. So among the novel applications, I've chosen to pick two of them, detection and power harvesting and light generation. Let's see what, how much I can uh, talk about this. So um, how do we do detection um, or power harvesting using nano antennas? We're looking for a detector, which is based on a nano antenna. And what we would like that thing to do is to basically convert the, uh, the AC, okay, the alternating current of electromagnetic uh, fields into direct current. Now, this thing actually exists. It has a name. It is called a rectenna. Okay? And it's a combination of two words, a rectifier and an antenna. And this, the way to do it is by placing a rectifying element, such as a diode, between the terminal of a, a, an antenna. And the idea is that light is being absorbed by the antenna. It induces AC, extremely high frequency AC current in the antenna. The diode or the rectifier rectify them and generate the direct current, and we are done. Like in nanophotonics, this is a known concept invented in the 60s and demonstrated by Raytheon in the RF and millimeter and the microwave regime. They were able to demonstrate 85% of conversion efficiency, microwave power to direct current, and they wanted to use it for um, uh, make these uh, unmanned uh, uh, a flying vehicle uh, to stay in, uh, in air forever, forever, or at least as long as they are illuminated by the, uh, uh, by the microwave. It didn't go too far because uh, we are limited by line of sight, but the idea is there. What we're trying to do is basically take this concept, make it in the, in the very small regime of optical frequency. So the antennas we have, the only thing we miss is the diodes. How do we make diodes? We have two concepts of making a diode. One of them is using a carbon nanotube connected between the uh, terminal of antenna consisting of two uh, different metals. And the idea is that the connection or the, the, uh, the contact between one of the metal would make a Schottky barrier or a diode, and the other one would be an ohmic 
uh, contact. So eventually we'll end up with a, something which is equivalent to a conventional Schottky diode, but much smaller and hopefully more appropriate for optical frequency. Optical frequencies, here we see a, 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 a DC characterization of the a, a diode that we see over here. Looks very similar to a classic diode which you buy in your um, nearest electronic shop. Another concept that we are working on is called the metal insulator, insulator metal uh, diode. Here we're using, again, antenna with two different, uh, uh, from two different uh, uh, materials, let's say um, aluminum and gold. They're separated by a small and thin oxide uh, a layer, and because of the differences between the uh, work function between the metals, we can also get a barrier which can be used for making a, a tunnel diode. Here we see a, an initial attempt to fabricate these devices. Each one of these structures is made of a different material, and keep in mind that what we see here is the ability to align two uh, masks, two, uh, right, two different writings in uh, E-beam, up to a few nanometer of, a, uh, of, uh, of registration. This is work which was done by Michal, and I find it extremely uh, impressive. And I hope to see uh, re uh, results coming from these kind of devices very shortly. Now, second application which I would like to talk about is novel light source, and the idea is the following. So, nano antennas can focus light into extremely small spots. So, how we can use that? We can make our antennas on a nonlinear uh, surface and use this uh, enhanced and very strong intensity to generate uh, second and third harmonics, and then we emit it. So basically, we, tight, we focus the light here into tight, into tight spots, we generate higher harmonic, and then we re-emit it, and we have a nice new source. The good thing here is that uh, and if you know a little bit about uh, nonlinear optics, there's no need for uh, phase matching here, which is one of the problem, or one of the, one of the issues, not a problem, but it's an issue in, uh, let's say, bulk or volume uh, nonlinear optics. But there's a major question here. What about the radiation efficiency of the higher harmonics? We want our antenna to be able to absorb light in harmonic one and emit it in the second harmonic. So it has to be an extremely broad bed antenna. It must cover a complete octave, maybe even more than that. So to do that, we started to look into the uh, options of making extremely or ultra wide band antennas. And uh, there is the following. In conventional antennas, we get high efficiency only at the resonance frequencies. And there's no reason to think that an antenna would resonate at a frequency and this same frequency at, uh, multiplied by t. So we need to design a new type of antenna, and the way you do that is by the following thing. This is a work done by uh, Zev and uh, uh, Amir Bog. We're making a non-resonant antenna. This is a, di this is a traveling wave antenna. It, it is inherently broadband. Okay? It's like a, a horn antenna. Maybe some of you have actually seen them on communication towers. And uh, the good thing about this antenna is that it does not have a resonance frequency. So its radiation efficiency can be extremely broadband. Here is a calculation of the radiation efficiency, and it covers all the range between about 800 nanometer to 3,000 nanometer. So this is like three octaves. This is a, a fabrication of this antenna, uh, and we are going to, we have characterized it in the same way that we have characterized our conventional antennas. So, what do we see here? Similar plot to what we saw uh, before. This is the, uh, the uh, scattering efficiency, this is the wavelength, and we see here two graphs, okay? One for an open antenna where we have a gap over here, and one for a short antenna where this gap is closed. Blue lines correspond to this kind. Green lines correspond to that kind. The dots are the experiments. The lines are the calculations. And there are no parameters fitting here. Okay, So we have almost perfect agreement between theory and experiment, which is very promising. A bit about the dimensions. We're about half a micron over here and over there. The gap is around 30 nanometers. 
and it can be used to focus light strongly into this gap. Now, does it work for nonlinear optics? And this is probably going to be the last slide that I'll show. Yes, this is the calculation of the uh, enhancement of the first harmonic in the gap uh, of this uh, uh, dual Vivaldi antenna. And this is the uh, second harmonic which is generated and then re-radiated inside the gap. So we have the ability to confine light in the gaps and efficiently generate and then re-emit the second uh, harmonic, making a new source. So I don't think I have enough time to talk about the third application of uh, particle trapping, but if you saw uh, Yuval and Michal's poster last, uh, uh, well, yesterday, then it was exactly about this uh, uh, topic, so let me skip that and go immediately to the conclusion. So uh, I hope that I convince you that nano antennas can provide a very efficient, simple, and inexpensive way for uh, making, uh, for realizing many applications in nanophotonics. We're able to demonstrate and fabricate and show uh, gold, not only gold actually, also from other materials, uh, nano antennas in telecommunication uh, wavelength. This is around 1,500 nanometer. Specifically, we were able to show that the radiation efficiency of these um, devices are extremely high in the order of 95%. We show, we demonstrated, fabricated, and designed, okay, not in this uh, uh, direction, of course, ultra wideband nano antennas, which can cover a complete octave. Uh, I didn't uh, show you that, but we were able to trap uh, trapping of gold nanoparticles with these nano antennas. And last but not least, we have very encouraging and promising results, and I believe that in the next few years we will make a lot of interesting application uh, in, from this research. And this is more than it, so thank you very much for your attention. to extract the DC current, right. you need to somehow contact it with ohmic contacts, right? right. So uh, wouldn't that interfere with the function of the antenna? Excellent question. So let me go back to uh, the slide over here. Now, maybe not this one, but hold on a second. That one. Now, uh, it doesn't show here, but oh, maybe it does not, it can it doesn't seem like a, but our diodes would be placed here between, in the gaps between these nano antennas. So this whole thing is completely electrically connected. I only need the pads in the upper and lower part of this array. It would not affect the uh, electromagnetic properties of the antenna. It would not destroy anything. This is one of the advantages of moving to these kind of, of, uh, of antennas. It's not only the, uh, the, the, the wide bandwidth. It's also the ability to almost immediately get electrical connectivity, which is difficult to get, let's say, using dipoles antenna. Okay? Connected in series. Yes. So it's like a bunch of, let's say, um, batteries connected in series. Yeah. You actually see it over here. Okay. Metal number one, metal, metal num number two, all of them connected in series. Okay. You only need the pads somewhere here and somewhere there. Kobe, what, what percentage of the power do you estimate you'll be able to... I'm sorry? What percentage of power do you think you'll be ah, able to convert? Wow. It's too early to say. Uh, the good news is that there's no inherent or physical limitation. Okay? For example, in the RF regime, people are able to show 85% of efficiency, which is way beyond every solar cell which exists today. Whether we will be able to get to this, let's say, range or not, it's a bit, it's a bit premature to say.